Hi, people of the internet. I'm Dave Rubin. This is The Rubin Report. It's Friday, which means it's time for another Friday Roundtable extravaganza. And joining me today is the founder of New Discourses and the author of The Marxification of Education, James Lindsay. And also joining me is the vice president of Strategy Risks and co-founder of Ideas Beyond Borders, Melissa Chen. James, Melissa, I feel like we're getting the band back together. How are you guys? We're good. Well, oh, I'm good. Hello, fellow uh, conceptual penis havers. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a specific reason that I wanted to have you guys on this week, uh, because obviously the last 10 days have been uh, pretty tough all around, regardless of what your politics are. And we've seen sort of just the level of craziness that we've all been dealing with for years is kind of exploding into every facet of society and culture and politics and everything else. But the two of you, I consider uh, two of the people that were kind of on the front end of warning about what woke was going to become. We used to all call it the regressive left and we were fighting identity politics and all of that. And people were calling us Nazis who suddenly now they seem to actually be Nazis or at least aligning themselves with modern Nazis. So I thought you guys would be perfect to have on today, not to really go into the nitty gritty of what missile was shot from where and what was destroyed in this and that, we all know about all that, but to kind of go back in time a little bit and talk about how woke uh, ended up becoming basically a, a, a Hamas front. So that's what we're gonna do today. Before we get to it, I wanna talk to you guys about Birch Gold. You guys know that Congress once again allowed itself to be pushed into appeasing the administration and raising the debt ceiling for the 79th time, paving the way for continued reckless spending and further devaluation of the dollar. Well, as our national debt continues to skyrocket, how are you protecting your savings? Times like these are a great reminder to, ver to diversify a portion of your gold, of your savings into gold, how about that? And you can do that with the help of Birch Gold. Here's the easiest way, guys. Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. You don't pay a penny out of pocket and as BRICS, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, band together against the dollar, more central banks are diversifying, and you're not gonna believe it, but they're buying gold. Follow their lead, visit birchgold.com slash Dave for your free info kit on gold. There's no obligation, just information. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. Visit birchgold.com slash Dave, and now back to me. Okay, so as I said, I wanna just jump into a time machine today back up into a little bit of how we kinda got here. So I thought this would be a nice video to start with. Uh, this is Democrat, former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, back in 2014, saying that Hamas is a humanitarian organization. War is a, is, is a deadly thing, and I have many Palestinians who live in my district, and I'm hearing from them regularly about how their families are affected, who live in the region. It's a terrible thing. But let me just say that any missile that comes from someplace has a return address, and if Israel is responding to that address, uh, uh, then it's a shame that the Palestinians are using, uh, are rumored to be using children and families as shields for their right. for their missiles right. uh, should we all try to you know first of all avoid conflict the hamas initiated this so again this uh, this has to be something where we try to have the two state solution that we have to support we have to support abbas and his role as leader there we have to support iron dome to protect the israelis from the missiles we have to support the right. palestinians and what they need and we have to confer with the qataris who have told me over and over again that hamas is a humanitarian organization maybe they could use their influence uh to um uh, to, the U.S. To thinks they're a matters. terrorist organization, though. Correct to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I and we've had that discussion. Yeah. Guys, I thought this was the perfect clip to start with because we're seeing so many people, usually Democrats in mainstream media, New York Times, CNN, et cetera, definitely MSNBC, just repeat talking points. That line there at the end, well, she talked to the Qataris and the Qataris said that Hamas was a humanitarian organization. Now remember, this is, this is nine years ago. I wanna reference one other thing before you guys jump in. She also mentions Abbas. Now she's talking about Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, who has not had elections in about 20 years or so. Uh, and she's saying we have to help him. Well, just this morning, 
Just literally just this morning, uh, the Palestinian Authority released an official document that they're sending to all the mosques in the West Bank, uh, and it calls actually for the direct incitement to murder of Jews, not just those pesky settlers or Israelis, and they quote the Quran in it. We're showing the image right now, right? So I can't read all the Arabic. I'm a little behind on my Arabic studies, but uh, you're gonna have to take my word for it or you can check on Twitter for a full translation of the whole thing. Uh, James, let me start with you on this. Um, this this sort of collapse that we've seen of the Democrat Party, the, the abandonment of liberalism and the running of cover for a lot of the bad guys. I take it you're not very surprised by any of it. I am completely not surprised, uh, completely not surprised. I mean, if anybody's been actually paying attention to the rhetoric, not just from, now I have to confess, like you don't speak Arabic, I don't speak drunk very well anymore, I left college, so. <laughs> she was pretty Nancy cogent was there. Follow. Yeah, but, back in the day though, she was way more cogent. Yeah, so um, as it turns out, anybody who's been paying attention to what they've been saying, what they've been writing, could have seen the writing on the wall, for example, a lot of people realize that the Democrats and the left in general have been kind of enthralled to this character named Angela Davis, who is kind of a domestic terrorist here in the US, openly communist, this kind of stuff. And she said that she was radicalized first when she was at UCLA underneath, or UCSD, one or the other, underneath Herbert Marcuse, the most famous of the neo-Marxists. Uh, and then she said she was radicalized the second time when, when she went to Palestine. And so there's been this Palestinian, she's written books about this, there's been this Palestinian uh, kind of leftist alliance running for a very, very long time. It's been an undercurrent in the left for this entire time. I was just in George Floyd Square about a week ago, and guess what there's a mural of? Angela Davis. What a big surprise. This is the current of the left. And so if if you studied Mao, as I've unfortunately had the, un, the displeasure of doing, um, Mao said that what he did in the 1940s was he used his formula, his famous formula of unity, criticism, unity, to first concentrate power in the Communist Party and then use that concentrated power to overthrow China in 1949. And this is exactly what I think we've seen progress over the past maybe 15 years. We've watched the very radical fringe within the Democrats consolidate power in the Democratic Party and lurch it into this extremism. And so, as I keep saying on Twitter right now, this is the house that woke built. Yeah, Melissa, you know, again, I started with that from 2014 because if you listen to the beginning portion, she's kind of making sense. You have to respond when rockets are shot at you and, you know, it's a damn shame they put kids with these rockets and everything else. And then it slips into just repeating what the Qataris want, which goes to my theory that the, the Democrats and, and the failure of the liberals, unfortunately, and I think all three of us at one time at least considered ourselves liberals or, or are old school liberals, not that it's worth explaining that much further at this point. Um, but do you see any mechanism within the Democrat Party or within the good liberals that still remain to push back on some of what we're seeing right now? Yeah, I think that's the question now. I've seen headlines, has Hamas killed woke? You're starting to see a bit of a realization, especially among like leftist Jews who are progressive, but are suddenly realizing, wait a minute, I marched with you you know, for Black Lives Matters. But when it came to the, you know, slaughtering of, of Jews in the kibbutzes and uh, near the border of Gaza, they, they threw them under the bus, right? Their own movement has thrown them under the bus. And it's, we've seen far too many progressives completely refusing to condemn the atrocities that Hamas has, uh, has conducted. We've seen them even sitting professors who said they found it um, exhilarating. I think that was the word that a Cornell professor used. It was yeah. cathartic to see, to see this. I mean, they're openly, they're, they're celebrating open season on Jews. And it's, it's out on the streets in so many major cities, in London, in Sydney, in New York. Um, and the reason for this is that wokeness has kind of given um, people a reason to treat any kind of oppressed group as if they're just completely beyond criticism, right? So you can't even bring yourself to criticize a, a, a group that is so clearly, so clearly just evil personified. And and I think what you saw in Pelosi's rhetoric there is just, it's just another kind of inclination to to see the good in, in these marginalized group and and not take them for its word. I mean, Hamas is quite clearly just ISIS reincarnate. And 
I, you know, one of the, the differences between when ISIS was, was kind of at its peak in 2014, 2015, I didn't see the left like open, so openly shill for ISIS. Like mm-hmm. there was, they may have denied their motivations, but what, five, we're like seven years from that, from, from 2015. And, and now you're starting to see it's it's gotten this is kind of like the the climax of of woke like people openly celebrating what Hamas has done yeah so i want to connect that to a video from 2021 and it's sort of uh, you're both referencing why this is going to make sense when you hear it now as crazy as it sounds this is the leader of Hamas back in 2021 at the height of our summer of love and the George Floyd riots and everything else and watch how on English television, he's trying to connect George Floyd to the plight of the Palestinians. I'm going to use this opportunity, and we're going to live the murder of the murder of George Floyd. George Floyd was killed in such days, the result of the murder of the murder of the murder of the people. Today, the murder of the murder of George Floyd Wait, I'm sorry, I'm actually a little confused for a moment. Do, were they reading the subtitles there? Oh, so you may not have seen the subtitles on that video, but in essence, as I laid it out, he was saying that what's happening in America with George Floyd is exactly what's happening in quote unquote Palestine with, uh, with the Palestinians. So I wanna show you one other thing right now. Uh, well, actually, James, let me, let me have you comment on that. The way they, can you explain a little bit about the way they connect these perceived oppressed groups? I mean, all forms of oppression are forms of oppression by dominant groups. That's what the the doctrine of intersectionality is about. It was a way to weld together all of the various claims to oppression in the world, all of the all of the groups that they wanted to be able to, to, to forge into what they call solidarity, which means that you agree with these people, you back these people up regardless of, of the details. They actually say that that's what it means. And it's not a surprise that Black Lives Matter called itself a decolonization movement. What's happening uh, from Hamas, they call it a decolonization movement. They say they're driving out the settler colonialists in Israel. It's the same exact thing. And the, the playbook was written by a radical who is considered, quote, dynamite in print by Antifa. And that, that, that radical's name is, is Franz Fanon. He was uh, writing in the 50s and in the 60s. In 61, he published his most famous book, which is The Wretched of the Earth. If you actually read woke stuff, you'll see them the appeal by name to the wretched of the earth all the time. They say it as a group of people, which would be Palestinians, which would be the capital B blacks that Black Lives Matter allegedly represented, that would be trans. These are all people that are in solidarity. And what decolonization is framed as in that book, the first chapter is called Concerning Violence. Franz Fanon writes in the first sentence that whatever you want to call it, the process of decolonization is always violent. And then this got summarized in the foreword, which was the most influential to the West by Jean-Paul Sartre, who was a you know lunatic Marxist, existentialist, French dirt bag. And <laughs> <laughs> frankly, and it was very popular, it turns out, in the Middle East, in the intellectual currents that surrounded the Palestinian uh, and, and Hamas rise. It, this is this has also been covered pretty well. It turns out that what Jean Paul Sartre said is that that these people are not just justified in taking back land and and even mental space through violence. It's exactly how they remake themselves as human beings. And so what Sartre describes to summarize Fanon is that decolonization is a ritual through murder to remake man as he should be. And uh, this is the current that runs through Black Lives Matter. It's the current that runs through the violence we see from the trans activists. It's the exact same current that's captured the Democratic Party and, and the left at large. And this is the same violence that we see from the statement that came out this morning from the Palestinian Authority. It's the same thing we see on the streets. By the way, you said, you know, Sydney and London and New York, Melissa. I saw the protest in Omaha, Nebraska the other day with my own eyes um, at the crossroads spot down there in downtown Omaha. So it's everywhere and this is this is woke this is what we have been nourishing in our universities this is what we've been feeding and pumping into our institutions this is what we've been enabling through unfettered immigration and now uh we have we've we've sown the storm and we're going to reap the whirlwind is i think where we're at melissa before i have you jump in i want to i want to show people the direct 
connection between woke ideas in schools that, that James is talking about, and then how these people end up quite literally in our government, often handling things as important as uh, immigration. Check this out from the Daily Wire. The US Immigration Enforcement Agency hired a former spokeswoman for the Palestinian Liber Liberation Organization, the PLO, and put her in a position to determine who gets to come into the country as an immigrant or asylum seeker. Now the Department of Homeland Security officer is repeatedly posting pictures of Hamas terrorist, terrorists parachuting in with guns and writing F Israel and any Jew who supports Israel, a Daily Wire investigation found. Nujwa Ali worked in 2016 and 2017 as a public affairs officer for the Palestinian, Palestinian delegation to the US, which according to its own website, served as the PLO office in DC. That office was expelled from the country uh, by the Trump administration, but Ali landed on her feet, according to a screenshot of her LinkedIn profile, securing a job at DHS as an asylum officer, where she was tasked with applying immigration laws and regulations to asylum applications. This January, she moved over to being an adju adjudication officer for the US citizenship and immigration services, people with that job, according to the agency, analyze new or amended legislation and policy, prepare written reports and findings, and review and make determinations on cases for immigration benefits. Melissa, this is particularly important because suddenly Jamal Bowman, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, they're saying that we should take in a million Gazans. And do you think that maybe we don't have the best of the best vetting these people or I guess a more cynical version would be that we actually have enemies within that are glad to let some bad people in. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think it's we deserve to find out what happened there. How on earth did the the fox, you know, get in charge of, of the chicken coop? Um, Want to jump back a little bit on on the uh, connecting all that dots and and why this particular story should alarm us all. It's that. You know, when when I saw these protests uh, in in New York City in Times Square, th there were signs and that that said resistance is not terrorism, and that word was very very prevalent during the the, the, the four years of the Trump mm -hmm. administration. You heard resistance all the time. Um, it, it's also what Antifa and BLM thought they were doing. Um, they under the banner of resistance, they justified burning, they justified looting, um, you know, beating up conservative uh, journalists to a pulp, you can justify so much under the banner of resistance. And that's how people are justifying now what Hamas is doing as well. And in the mindset of these people, you know, where you have this bundle of ideas that kind of get like swallowed wholesale, everywhere, everything from, you know, decolonization to anti-racism and everything. And by the way, decolonization, it, it's very clear that this radical rhetoric with zero limiting principles was not merely just a call to rid curricula of Mozart and Shakespeare. Uh, it, it turns out, and, and I think, you know, the left is waking up to that, that it's far, far, far more sinister. Mm -hmm. um, and and so for someone like Nuja, is that her name, who is working for the DHS? Uh, I, I, I don't know the exact pronunciation, but hopefully we don't know, need to know her name after this. By the way, I should note that she's on leave as of yesterday, so there is, a, I guess, a bit of a silver lining here. Good, but you can imagine that uh, somebody with that kind of mindset of resistance, what they would be willing to do in that capacity in order to achieve their political goals. And that's what makes them dangerous. James, I wanna ask you one other thing on this before we get to the next segment, which is how, do you, how is it, do you think, or do you know, or is someone doing some research on this, that they can just flip the switch of when they want protests? So for example, we had the year of protests against Trump and for BLM and Antifa, and they were you know, diverse and peaceful po protests that were burning down buildings and destroying every Pep Boys and Target. Then it disappears when we get two years of Biden, but then it's basically like overnight, they can have high school kids in San Francisco rampaging through the schools, screaming free Palestine. Now, these kids have no idea what they're saying, but how is the switch actually flipped that ignites all of these kids? Like, is this coordination on freaking, I don't know, I don't know what, is this TikTok? Like, what is this? 
Well, I mean, they do they do identify influencers and, and centers of influence of that kind. I think that's the actual term in the older literature is centers of influence. So in the media, they they ramp up the, the messaging. On social media in particular, they ramp up the messaging to get the younger people. But uh, within these high schools, they keep putting out the narrative that this is student-led protest, student-led activism, student-led activity. But in fact, in almost every case, I have mm-hmm. a researcher that works for Parents Defending Education that's dug into this and I'm friends with. And he says in almost every case, you can pull it back to some pro uh, left NGO that is, is is telling them it's time to flip the switch that's putting a few of the kids who are going to go march out and start the thing and then it's just just like with what we saw with Black Lives Matter you get a few agitators to start just to take a allegedly peaceful protest and turn it crazy and the whole thing kind of catches fire because that energy is already there and people are already kind of primed to do it and they're they're already fed with the woke ideology I'll do another connect the dots around, you know, Melissa did the word resistance. Look at the word in the middle of PLO, liberation. Mm -hmm. What did Mao call his army, the People's Liberation Army? Herbert Marcuse, who I mentioned earlier, his one of his most influential pieces of writing from 1969 was an essay on liberation. Che Guevara led liberation armies. Black Lives Matter claimed that they were working for liberation. The trans rights activists claimed that they're working for liberation. Liberation is a communist code word. And so what you're actually seeing is probably something extremely coordinated that's being fed largely through these different NGOs, but also pressed through the compliant and complicit media. And they can turn on the switch because the people that they need to go do these protests, these activities, these demonstrations are already primed Mm -hmm. that once it starts to just join in, it's the right thing to do. Uh, They're afraid that they'll be ostracized by their friends if they don't take part. We saw the scene in Black Lives Matter where there was the one girl who even said she agreed with Black Lives Matter who was surrounded by, you know, a hundred some odd people with their fists raised in her face telling her to raise her fist and she didn't because it felt compelled and that became an iconic image. There's this sense that you'll be left out, ostracized, lonely, shamed, bullied by your friends, lose your friends group for standing up and not participating in these things. So it's very easy to get momentum going if you just have a small number of agitators willing to go out and do this. And they can be activated by both media, but also like my friend has dug up, you know, nonprofit uh, activation activities. Right. And any of us can think back to high school and the pressure you're under from friends. And when you talk about that, as our friend Abigail Schreier writes, the social contagion that leads to all of these girls thinking they're boys, it's the same type of social contagion that leads to them chanting for for genocide, basically. I want to move on and talk a little bit about how this is sort of hitting us also from a, a cultural perspective, not just education and not just our ridiculous politicians. But real quick, guys, let me talk to you about Satellite Phone Store. Uh, You know that fires, hurricanes, and tornadoes can happen almost anywhere. And your cell phone could go down as a result, but not satellite phone. Satellite phones will always work because you are carrying your personal cell tower with you everywhere or anywhere you want to go on Earth. Anyone who has a satellite phone in the affected areas of Hawaii, the Nevada desert, Burning Man, for example, has a way to communicate with friends, family, and emergency services. Prepare prepare for the unexpected. The most secure way to communicate is from a satellite phone to satellite phone. You can't be tracked and no one can listen in on your calls. Even the US military uses satellite phones for secured communication. So here's a deal for you. Visit sat123.com or call 866 866- 3201884 and use promo code DAVE50 to waive the $50 activation fee. The service is only applicable to those in the USA. Again, just visit sat123.com and use promo code DAVE50 to waive the $50 activation fee or call 866-320-1884. And now back to us. All right, so I want to show a little bit of how all of this wokeness that leads to this bizarre guilt and an incapacitated group of people who seemingly can't step up against a bunch of 15-year-olds who don't know what they're protesting about, uh, how it's been pushed on us virtually at every level. There is a girl by the name of Sarah Rayo. Uh, she is, she's, I suppose, big on Twitter as one of these anti-racist people, although everything that she writes out uh, is seemingly racist. She's a, she considers herself an American radical political activist, so of course she got a TV show. Uh, the TV show is called Race to Dinner, and yes, it's as bad as you think. Take a look. You, actually, Margaret, you didn't say yours. What? Your racist thing. Thing that you've done. Thought about or I done. Know. You have something inside of you that's not quite, like, that's racist. 
So you must have you must have examples in your own life. Well, I also work in environmental engineering. I have absolutely no people of color or minimal people of color, possibly the exclusion of being slightly Hispanic. No. I mean, Saira doesn't like, like her attitude. <laughs> I can say a racist thing you've done because it just happened. When you just talked to me the way you just did, this is how white women talk to us all the time. These are microaggressions. When I say the exact same thing to my white girlfriend who says the same exact thing. I don't care if you talk to everybody like that. Okay. Right? The way you just spoke to me was straight up white supremacy. You actually just answered with racism. White supremacy so is said to be hidden in innocuous phrases and banal behavior. The smallest things could be considered racist. It's enough that a person from a minority group feels insulted. Absolutely. Sounding terribly white. I don't know that I was all that racist to start with, but I also would be more aware or hyper aware of my thoughts or reactions to circumstances that would be racist. I have so many jokes and so many comments that I wrote down, I honestly don't know where to start, other than the British guy who was doing the voiceover in honor of racism shot himself in the head because he was an old white man at the end of recording that thing. Melissa, these people are so extraordinary pathetic, extraordinarily pathetic, but again, they're just, they're just reacting to a society that has gone completely wrong. Yes, oh, by the way, like, they, they pay her $500 for that. She doesn't pay them to sit there. They pay her $500 for the privilege of having a meal where someone tells you that you're a white supremacist. Melissa? Yeah. Okay, do, do you notice how smug that woman was? The one who's accusing the poor white woman of, of being racist. She was so smug. She was being a bully. And this whole scene to me looks like these are... Are, are people that have terrible personalities that find camouflage in the ide ideology. Like she's just using this ideology to kind of bully this woman and to talk to her in a way that's just, you know, feeding her own narcissism, it seems like to me. I mean, James probably knows more about this kind of phenomenon, but but that's just what it, what it, what it seems like it, it is to me, that, that it just gives you a license to treat others, which with cruelty, with such viciousness. Am I, and, am and, I right? And it's, it's just evil. Like, it's just, it's, James, please. It's just patently evil. What you just watched just now was a Maoist struggle session. But the irony is that Mao had to throw people in prison to get them put into conditions of struggle, <laughs> whereas literally you can get awful white women signing up to pay $500 a piece to participate in their own struggle session. But the point of the struggle session was that you had this, this, uh, social group around you that was going to help you uh, want to confess to these crimes, but you also had a interrogator who would accuse you of crimes that in, in the, the phrasing from, from the Chinese that you were not able to recognize. And so the goal was to help you learn to recognize your crimes, in this case, your crimes of racism, which were invisible to you. And the goal is to bully you and to hound you and to create a social environment where it feels like there's a pressure for you to want to confess. And then the second you start to confess, the next stage is to say that your confession's not sincere enough. And you continue to twist the thumb screws, the emotional and social thumb screws, until you get people like at the end we saw the lady saying that she you know she could be more aware i could learn more about my my invisible <laughs> crimes so what you're what's being ha what's happening is there is there there's a f imaginary crime on contrived standards the systemic racism microaggressions blah 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 crt line and the goal is to bully people into accepting those contrived terms so that they can learn to recognize how they are criminal against the people. What, what the Maoists called it was learning to see from the people's standpoint, which is exactly what we call woke now. You're learning to see things from the critical race theorist standpoint or from the person of color's point of view. And that's exactly what we heard from Syrah Rao. Now, I will point out as far as jokes go that the, the, the translation service committed a microaggression by misspelling her name. It, it spelled it Syla instead of Syrah, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious. Um, but uh, what you watched is a Maoist struggle session. What you watched is a, a form of psychological torture that rather than having, you know, four or $5,000 worth of money going to the perpetrator of this thing, she should be held to account under, under uh, laws against torture because it is a form of psychological torture. I want to show you one more. This is, this is a shorter clip. Let me, just throw in, let me just throw in one other shorter clip because it's not just that these white women are racists, their mothers are racists. 
I do think every white person in the United States is racist. I'm a racist and my mother, I think I said it was a racist, wonderful person, wonderful lady. I mean, that's a, I think, I think there's no mixing up. You can be a really good person and still be racist. Why, what are we doing with our lives? Melissa, defend white people. You're Asian, that doesn't bode well for you in this game either, but you know, come on, give me a little something for white people. Well, okay, so I, I, that's the question I was gonna ask is, is what is driving, you know, given that this is a struggle session and that they, they're actually paying money to actually be a part of this, I don't really understand what drives a normal person to want to, to submit themselves to the psychological torture. Is it kind of like these finance bros, these like high flying tech CEOs who pay financial dominatrix to mm -hmm. like shame them or something? Is this kind of like willingly submitting to a humiliation uh, session? I, I, I don't really understand what's going on, but you know, I, I think we've in a way just created a, um, a moral there are there, there are status to be gained by flagellating yourself, it seems. And when you have these kind of moral incentives, they get rewarded based on the social hierarchy. You know, if you acknowledge your racism and you're part of this movement, um, you, you're you gonna have moral entrepreneurs to kind of take advantage of that market. You know, we've told white people that um, they they have this original sin. They have they were born with this privilege, and so kind of to redeem themselves and to to regain their moral status in society, it seems like this is what they must do. Either that, or you know, try to acquire some sort of um, oppression points in a way, right? And that's the part where you were talking about earlier about social contagions and you know perhaps identifying as a, a sexual minority in some way. That that's why you have this phenomenon of like you know, queer, queer white people, it's like, are, you're not gay, you're not, you're just queer, so you, you at least have this one oppression point. You're just you annoying. Identify. Usually it just means they're annoying. That's kind of how it works. But actually, yeah. you're giving me a great segue there, Melissa, because it's not just that you suddenly, if you're woke, have to be for, you know, beheading a Holocaust survivor and calling your mother racist. You also have to be for biological men beating women in sports. Here is video of a trans female weightlifter, also known as a dude, explaining why he should be able to beat chicks in weightlifting. What is it to be a woman? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> so I don't think it's a good question. I don't, because I think people want it to be objective and clear and there to be clear criteria. And I think that's impossible. And I think we need to accept that. And I think that's a difficult thing to accept. Gender is more beautiful and more complex than what is a man, what is a woman. So who are women? The people who say they are, I think is the easier way to go about it. The male body has a bigger strength than the female body. What do you think about that? The question isn't, are male bodies bigger than female bodies, but are trans women, trans female bodies bigger than cis female, cis women's bodies? Trans women are female, like actually female. Um, medically female, legally female. My doctors treat me as any other female. Driver's license, passport, my racing licenses all say female. Before I have you guys chime in, we've had an internal debate on the show all week because for the last 10 days, I've cursed more on this show than at any other time in the history of the whole show. I've called people all sorts of names and everything else. And, and my mom said to me yesterday, David, could you just ease up a little bit on that stuff? So I'm actually not gonna comment on that video of that wonderful person that you just saw there. Uh, James, I'll allow you because I can't control my guests, obviously. Can you explain yeah. anything that that person just said? I can explain pretty much all of it. Gender is beautiful, though. It's much more beautiful than the ugly person saying it, um, who, <laughs> as we all saw. I mean, I see good-looking guys. I see beautiful women on this program. I don't see it on that. But <laughs> the fact that it's just easy to see. I mean, we don't have to we don't have to kid ourselves. But the fact of the matter is, is that we see yet another kind of crime that you have to learn to recognize. So you empower that moral entrepreneurship or moral bullying that we we're just talking about. It's another basis to have an interminable number of struggle sessions to 
to browbeat people. You know, gender is much more complicated than sex. It's in fact, you can't even really define what it is, which means you have to appeal to somebody like that in order to define what it is. In other words, like Kentonji Brown Jackson said when she couldn't answer what is a woman despite being a woman, she said, we need an expert to tell us who qualifies as male and who qualifies as female. We need an expert to guide us through life. And the only qualified experts are the people who have the secret knowledge of what it takes that they've adopted through queer theory. And if you can't see it, well, you're transphobic. You're, you know, get, Dave, I know you're very homophobic. It's a big problem in your life. Only and to one guy, to the be, guy I'm married to. Yeah, well, he thinks you're homophobic too. I mean, everybody thinks yeah. you're homophobic. We all know you're yeah. homophobic because you actually you, you do crazy things like pass. You don't Although phobia is an irrational fear. I have a rational fear of him. You know what I mean? If I don't well, make yeah, the bed, I mean, it's I, fully I, rational. I also have a, a fully rational fear of mental illness, um, as it turns out, visible mental illness, as a matter of fact. And so the, the, the fact is that what you're seeing is another basis for another set of struggle sessions to twist more thumbscrews on more people who are led around by their uh, uncontrolled empathy uh, into lunacy and madness, which becomes a downward spiral until the next thing you know, you're chanting for whatever slogan it is, trans women or women, Black Lives Matter you know, apparently gas the Jews, um, that the that the big complex throws at you and says that you have to support this week. Melissa, you're a chick. What's the deal with that? <laughs> with chicks? We we have failed to gatekeep so many concepts. And this is one of those, you know, downfall of Western civilization things, right? We we've failed to gatekeep the concept of a woman. We failed to gatekeep racism even, we've allowed them to redefine what racism is, and all these concepts that we've just like expanded and, and not tried to assert, no, that is just because you feel like a woman, as sh this person said in the clip, doesn't mean you're a woman. There, there is a meaning to that. And it's very clear what it is. But for whatever reason, and you know, this is where Peter and, and James have talked a lot about this, this kind of st standpoint epistemology where everything is just what it is because that's what you you know feel like or it's completely subjective. It depends on, on, on the person talking or, or interpreting it. Um, this, is, this is the path that leads us down. And on the back of the, of, of the room, you saw the word sport is a human right. No, this is not about sport. <laughs> <laughs> this is that's a corruption of what this issue is. This is about this is about about women's leagues and whether or not men deserve to be in these spaces, whether or not men deserve to be, um, you know, in contact with with women in prisons and um, competing in in contact sports where women's skulls could get bashed. I mean, the, the stakes are very high. As our friend Douglas Murray says, one day the barbarians will be at the gate and we will be debating what gender pronouns to call them. Uh, I just want to show you guys two more clips because I want to connect this wider now to, the, to sort of politically everything that's happening. And then James, I, we have to go short here today because you, where, where are you going? Do, do we even want to say it? Because I know there's already going to be a lot of protesters on there. Do you want me to yeah, give you a break well. here? We're what? going to Hartford, Connecticut is where we're going. And we're going we're gonna to bring the fire of truth to Hartford, Connecticut and show the people the way. You're basically, you're going to Hartford, Connecticut with Moms of Liberty, who are a great organization. I know the ladies, and of course, they're now being called Nazis and everything else. They're actually fighting the Nazis, but uh, all right, we'll, we'll post some video, I'm sure, of the wonderful protesters. Uh, but I want to connect this to the wider political thing at the moment. Uh, here is an MSNBC reporter uh, announcing the latest in what's going on with Trump and these indictments that he now has a partial gag order, and we'll connect it to everything else that we're talking about. Minutes ago, Judge Tanya Chutkin announced from the bench that she will impose a partial gag order on former President Donald Trump. Specifically, she will prohibit all parties in the case, including Mr. Trump, from making or reposting any statements publicly targeting the special counsel, his staff, the judge's staff or court personnel, and also will prohibit statements about potential witnesses and the subject of their testimony. They're really put in, in on stark display the clash here between uh, the First Amendment and Donald Trump's ability to speak as he's running for president. Melissa, the reason I wanted to show that clip is because I think there's a direct correlation to the people who are behaving like Nazis now are the ones who called everyone else, including Donald Trump, a Nazi for years. Thus, they will clearly not stand up 
for his free speech rights or his ability to run for president for all the frustrations I might have with him. And it seems pretty obvious, perhaps would get us to some of that communist Mao kind of stuff you were talking about earlier, James. Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's the same with uh, James mentioned uh, reference uh, Moms for Liberty and Moms for Liberty is, you know, a parent parent group, largely a grassroots parents organization that's been trying to counter the influence of CRT in, in, in education all the way from K to 12 to um, to college. And they were they were considered terrorists. They were labeled as terrorists by Biden's DOJ. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the same faction of people that are they seem to be completely unable to to call Hamas what they are, which is you know terrorists. It just seems to me that the more they 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 try to, you know, gag Trump, uh, it it just seems like this political, politically motivated actions to just prevent him from speaking, prevent him from being able to engage in in a way that a, a, a presidential candidate can. Is only boosting his popularity. Like we're 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 seeing. I, I just saw the morning consult poll, um, in head to head with Biden in swing states like Arizona and Georgia and and Michigan. Trump is actually leading. Um, and so, the more they try to do this, the more they try to call somebody, you know, a Nazi and you know, white supremacist when there clearly isn't any evidence. He becomes a martyr for for the cause, and and people start seeing that, and they're like, wait a minute, that's not what's going on here, and so they they react and they say, you know what, you're calling my guy this, you're calling us this. I mean, it was extended to all Trump Trump supporters. I mean, that was the whole point about, uh, you know, the the, the four years of, of Trump. It's like anyone that was remotely that they could expand that concentric circle of to to tar with the label of Nazi white supremacist bigot they got tarred. Um, and so we're living in, in, in kind of this, you know, weird moral myopia now where the very people who are acting like Nazis, targeting the Jews, outright calling and enjoying the idea of ethnic cleansing. And, and, you know, they're, they're, they're escaping. Yeah, you, gave, you gave me another great segue because I've got one more clip for you. And then, James, I'll let you take us out on this. Uh, this is from The View. And it was a miracle because earlier in the week, I played a clip of The View and I and I actually had to give some of them credit for kind of getting this thing right. Joy and uh, Ana Navarro. And the, some of them were kind of right. Obviously, Sonny Hostin is, is complete lunatic. Uh, but Rachel Maddow, Rachel Maddow, who has lied about everything over the last couple of years, Trump being a Nazi, she lied about COVID vaccines, election interference. I mean, she has lied about everything. Watch what she does here. This is exactly what you just laid out, Melissa. They accuse you of doing everything they are doing or have done. Check this out. The Republican Party right now has to make a decision, and it's their decision to make. We have party processes for a reason, but Ultimately, if you listen to what Trump is saying, you don't just re sort of regard him as a um, as a spectacle, but you re listen to what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's basically portraying a future for America if he is put back in the White House, in which we don't have another election after. Yeah, that. that's right. Because the elections are all rigged; that the democratic process can't be yep. trusted; that Congress should just work for him, the Justice Department should just work for him. That's a strong man form of government. That's go not what we it. have. He'd cancel the news; like the right. news are done. That yeah. he wants to put MSNBC on trial for treason so yeah. that he can execute. I mean, this is... And this he will is, put Rudy Giuliani on the Supreme Court. If he makes it that long, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it is... that <laughs> The Republican Party is... If they're going to if elevate somebody like that to represent their party in a, in a general election, not only do we have a 50-50 shot of him being back in the White House, right. any major party nominee has a 50% yeah. sh right. shot, but the Republican Party will have to reckon with that for the till the end of time mm -hmm. in terms of what they did to this country. Wow. Yeah. Everything she said. I mean, she spent four years claiming that Trump was an illegitimate president. All of the COVID stuff, everything else. By the way, I think Rudy actually would be quite a good Supreme Court judge. I don't think anyone's really, well, I can't say anyone. I certainly don't think uh, that his uh, legal mind uh, is not worthy of that. Uh, James, I, I, I suspect, again, this doesn't surprise you, the behavior. This is, it, it's baked into their ideology, right? Yeah, well, the iron law of projection never, of woke projection never misses. The, it, it, it's an iron law. They always tell you what their intentions are. It's one of the best heuristics to guess what they have up their sleeve. And Rachel Maddow should have just scared the crap out of virtually everybody in the country that understands that they're telling you what their plans are when they project them onto their enemy. But 
what we were watching here, I can connect all this back to Mao again, what we just saw with Trump, with the gag order. Um, <clears throat> Mao said in 1957, he gave a speech called On the Correct Handling of Contradictions Among the People. He defined the people and the enemies of the people, said we have to start there. The people, he said, explicitly are those that support the building of socialism. So in other words, his movement would be woke today, everything that goes with it. The enemies of the people are everybody who doesn't support that. That would be Donald Trump today for one example. And what he says is that the dictatorship of the people that he was establishing, which is a democratic process apparently, is going to, he called it democratic centralism, is going to to, to use the, the dictatorship, the power of the dictatorship on the enemies of the people. And he specifically says that the things that it will do is revoke for a time their right to speak and the right to vote. And so he explicitly says there, that there'll be censorship and disenfranchisement. This whole concept gets taken up. I mentioned Marcuse earlier. We can't not mention Marcuse again because in 1965 he writes an essay titled "An Essay on Liber." Uh, sorry, the, the titled uh, "Repressive Tolerance," which gets put in a book called "A Critique of Pure Tolerance." And in "Repressive Tolerance," the thesis statement explicitly near the end of the essay, the thesis statement of the essay itself is that movements from the left must be extended tolerance, and movements from the right must have tolerance withdrawn from them. Mm -hmm. And he again mentions censorship. He's something he calls pre-censorship and lots of other uh, forms of disenfranchising people on movements from the right. And so what we're seeing is Mao come to America by means of the neo-Marxist or critical Marxist movement as it went into identity politics. It's silencing people like Trump. It's fully on, on display with all of the movements we talked about, whether it's BLM, whether it's a trans women in sports, whether it's uh, this crazy stuff from Hamas and the support that we're seeing from every woke university and every major city and democratic politicians, uh, what we're seeing is, is Maoism having come to America and taking a very hideous form that I think people are fortunately starting to wake up to now that it's gotten quite uh, as ugly as it has. But even the gagging of Trump falls into the exact same mold. Yep. Um, and we will, we should expect that what Rachel Maddow just said Everything is exactly, she, she did a gigantic confession about everything that they plan to bring from their side if we are uh, ineffective in, in standing up to stop them. Well, Melissa, now that James has freaked everyone out before the weekend, uh, I ask you to end us on a positive note somehow. Give me, the, give me the silver lining. I think there's partly a silver lining related to some of the lefties finally coming around, as you referenced earlier. But, but is there anything else that we can look at right now uh, that might give us a little hope in the midst of this? Yes, uh, it, it looks like you know donors have been pulling their funding from Harvard and UPenn and all these endowments of big universities um, that were not clear on on denouncing. It, it, and it was a very low bar, right? All you have to do is just kind of denounce Hamas. Like you can still support the Palestinian cause if you want it to still kind of do both sides, but at least denounce Hamas. Like that was such a low bar that mm -hmm. our presidents couldn't even do. And and it, the student groups that had all signed these letters, it seems like there's a lot of backpedaling now because firms won't hire them. And so we're starting to see backlash, corporate America, billionaires, you know, investor types. Um, so I, I think people have woken up. Um, let, let's see, you know, how, um, whether this continues, whether or not there's more of a snowball effect, uh, like what, what other, what other domains in American society are going to be are going to be affected by, by this. Well, I thank you guys. I'm proud to be in this fight with you for a long time. And unfortunately, <laughs> this fight ain't, ain't going anywhere. So we will do this again. Uh, James, I wish you good luck with the gender, queer, two-spirit Hamas supporters uh, today. So uh, bon voyage. Melissa, I'll see you soon. And for everybody else, we've got a post-game show in about 37 seconds at rubenreport.locals.com. That was my impression of the British guy who shot himself after the thing. Okay, see you, everybody. <laughs>